think we'll get started. Um, welcome to uh, the 2021 edition of Grand Rounds. Uh, this is our first one for 2021. Um, today is a, a little bit different style of Grand Rounds. We'll be talking about the multidisciplinary uses of SGLT2 inhibitors. Um, so I'll start by giving kind of an overview and a platform of why this is an important topic and why it's going to be useful in your everyday practice, regardless of what specialty you go into. And then we'll have uh, Dr. Lerma speak um, about the, the renal benefits of SGLT2 inhibitors today. And following that, Dr. Powell will be speaking next week on the cardiovascular benefits and uses of SGLT2 inhibitors. Um, so to start things off, what are SGLT2 inhibitors? Well, if we actually go back in time, um, SGLT2 uh, inhibitor concept has been around since about 1933, uh, when the discovery of uh, fluorazine first occurred. Um, that, that chemical is actually extracted from a, uh, an apple tree, the bark of an apple tree, and it's been studied um, extensively. Similarly, uh, just like many things in medicine, um, nature has kind of given us uh, kind of a hack into how, to, how to, to fix underlying medical conditions. And part of this, if you go back and look at a condition called familial renal glucosuria, is actually a natural model for SGLT2 inhibitors, wherein there's a defect, a genetic defect, in the SGLT2 uh, transporter. So what exactly is SGLT2 transporter? Well, it's in the proximal tubule of the kidney, and it's a sodium glucose co-transporter. And by inhibiting this transporter, what you, what you effectively have is blocking reabsorption of sodium and glucose. So effectively, you will be losing glucose in your urine, and on top of that, you're going to be losing sodium as well. So you're going to additionally have uh, an osmotic and an osmotic diuresis, as well as a naturesis, which is going to kind of play into some of the, the cardiovascular uh, benefits that Dr. Powell will be talking about next week. So making the allusion to um, this natural condition, the familial renal hypo hyperglucosuria, uh, it's actually interesting because the ideal medication for a, a diabetic patient is one that's going to uh, improve glycemic control, improve insulin sensitivity, uh, lower A1C, and um, have minimal or no hypoglycemia side effects. In addition to that, um, having a cardiovascular uh, benefit has become of, of great interest over the last uh, decade or two because of how interconnected we know diabetes is with um, heart disease uh, in, in addition to renal disease. So who are the players that we're talking about? Which ones are the SGLT2 inhibitors? So in, in 2013, um, the first approved the first approved uh, SGLT2 inhibitor was uh, canagliflozin. Following that, dapagliflozin and empagliflozin were approved in 2014. And then in 2020, ertagliflozin uh, was approved. There's a fifth agent that is actually approved in the European Union currently, um, but is still in phase three clinical trials in the United States, and that's sodagliflozin. Sodagliflozin is a little bit different um, in its mechanism of action because it also blocks the SGLT1 inhibitor, which is also present in the, the kidneys, uh, but is only responsible for about 10% um, of the amount of uh, glucosuria that is produced in inhibiting uh, either the SGLT1 or 2 um, transporter. So who, who stands to benefit from taking one of these agents? Well, the three big categories, um, people with type 2 diabetes, 
people with heart failure uh, and cardiovascular disease, and then people with chronic kidney disease. And as you know, this is, this, this is a pandemic in itself. The numbers over the past decades have just been steadily increasing. Most recent, the most recent data uh, says that in the U.S. we have about 30 to 32 million people suffering from type 2 diabetes, which is about 10% of our population. That translates to a $327 billion cost to the United States and the, and the U.S. healthcare system to take care of these patients. In terms of the heart failure population, there's about 6.2 million people in the United States, about 2% of the population that suffer from uh, systolic heart failure. And that translates to a $30.7 billion cost to the, to the system. And finally, the chronic kidney disease patients, stage one through four, there's about 45 million patients in the United States, about 14% of our population that suffers from CKD. That translates to about $84 billion in cost to the, the U.S. healthcare system. If you add on top of that patients with ESRD that are, uh, that are dialysis dependent, uh, that adds an additional about $34 uh, billion on top of the $84 billion. So if we have, can develop a medication or use one that already exists that's able to target these three uh, patient populations, which there is significant overlap, you know, there is a potential that we may actually be able to, to reduce some of these costs if we can have a mechanism of action that is uh, that has a, a threefold potential. Um, so with that, I will kind of set the stage of who should champion this medication. Is this the responsibility of the primary care doc that's kind of managing the type 2 diabetes with an A1C of 8.5? Is this should, be, should this be championed by an endocrinologist who is, uh, who is much more involved in, in complex diabetes management? Should this be championed by the cardiologist and heart failure specialist now that it's uh, part of guideline-directed medical therapy for patients with systolic heart failure? And there's emerging data coming out that it, it may also be beneficial in patients with diastolic heart failure. Or finally, should this be championed by our nephrology colleagues who take care of, of patients with chronic kidney disease with a variety of etiologies? So kind of with that thought in mind, I, I ask you guys to kind of open your minds into the, all the patients that you're seeing on a daily basis that, that are not on SGLT2 inhibitors and could potentially benefit, and also to try to increase uh, this in your daily practice, not necessarily prescribing the medication, but at least thinking about it and thinking about those patients that could benefit from it. So with that being said, I'll turn things over to Dr. Lerma. Very much. Um, thank you very much, Chad, uh, for that um, um, nice uh, segue to this uh, talk. So um, the original design of this talk is uh, we're supposed to talk about for only like 20 minutes, and then um, Dr. Krikorian and, and I, um, Dr. Krikorian is going to talk about the endocrine part of it, uh, Dr. Powell is going to talk about the cardiology part of it, and I'm going to talk about nephrology. Um, so I start off with this slide, and you can see where the apple is, <laughs> uh, where, where that's coming from since uh, Chad mentioned that already. So um, few can foresee whether their road will lead them till they come to its end. So I want to give you an outline of my talk uh, for this afternoon. So we start off with an outline, which is sort of a, uh, like a GPS. You know, this is how we're going to tackle this topic because it's so broad. You know, there's different ways by which you can slice and dice the information. So we start off with the literature review. Some of you may know me, I'm a Spider-Man geek kind of guy. So I do collect everything Spider-Man. Um, <laughs> but anyway, I just have to put this in there. So we'll start off with the literature review. 
we're going to go through the clinical practice guidelines that are currently available and published. And then lastly, we are going to apply what the guidelines have told us and what we know from literature to clinical practice. So in um, early 2020, I was given the opportunity to give grand rounds at, um, at uh, Harvard. And, you know, um, I was so fortunate. This was pre-COVID, <laughs> pre-US COVID at least. And it was truly an honor because I was able to, you know, tour uh, the hospital, the university. Um, this guy, this, the picture of this guy behind me is Barry Brenner, who's sort of a well-known figure in nephrology. Uh, he's written the book called uh, Brenner and Rector's The Kidney, which is, you know, I remember when I was a, a resident, my, my girlfriend then, who's my wife now, gave me the fifth edition of that book. I think right now it's in the 12th edition. So the other picture here says of mice and men, and I'm not referring to the topic, I mean, the, the plot of the story about Lenny. No, I'm not referring to that. I just want to say of mice and men because SGLT2 inhibitors, uh, what we know about it really is related to mice and men. So according to Dr. Brenner's hypothesis, hyperfiltration drives nephrons to glomerular sclerosis, and eventually this leads to chronic kidney disease and end-stage kidney disease. So reducing hyperfiltration has been the major paradigm for slowing the progression of chronic kidney disease through RAS inhibition. The actual mechanisms of hyperfiltration in diabetic kidney disease, however, remain poorly understood until the seminal report that Forisin, which is isolated by French chemists in the 1800s from the bark of the apple tree, as Chad mentioned, is a naturally occurring SGL2 SGLT2 inhibitor found in unripe apple, and it inhibited glomerular hyperfiltration in the diabetic rat. So based on those studies, the hypothesis was put forward that stimulation of tubular glucose and sodium transfer to the SGLT2 system reduced tubular glomerular feedback, and this decreased hyperfiltration in patients in di the diabetic kidney disease. So subsequent micropuncture studies provided evidence in support of this hypothesis on their long-term SGLT2 inhibitor administration in, in diabetic mice who lack the SGLT2 transporter. So in similar studies, SGLT2 inhibitors prevented changes in blood pressure, glomerular size, and markers of inflammation. So, um, if you go through the literature, there's a lot of benefits of SGLT2 inhibitors, whether it's for diabetic control, for blood pressure control, um, as well as for outcomes. So I want to start by showing these studies. So you can see in this study there, I, I'm, we're going to tackle all of these studies, uh, the Empereg study, the Canva study, as well as the Credence study. Um, I'm not going to go too much about the declared Timmy study because it's more of a cardiac study, and I'm sure Dr. Powell is probably going to um, talk about that. So uh, this slide shows you on one side, you have your ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers. On the other side, you have your SGLT2 inhibitors, and how they're, they, the studies affected composite renal outcome, end-stage kidney disease, MACE outcomes, which is major adverse cardiovascular events, and death from any cause, whether cardiovascular as well as congestive heart failure. So the US FDA approved the first SGLT2 inhibitor in early 2013, followed by the report of the mandatory cardiovascular outcome safety trial. So you could see here in this slide, so in 2013, that's when your first uh, SGLT2 inhibitor came out, and subsequently, the studies, Empereg, Canvas study, Declare Timmy, uh, Credence, as well as Vertis, and we're going to go through these uh, studies uh, one by one. But before we go on to the, um, to the studies, one thing that is very prominent in this slide is the presence of the hazard ratio. So hazard ratios are measures of association which is used in prospective studies. It is the result of comparing the hazard function among those exposed 
to the hazard function among those who are not exposed to the tested drug. So when you see a hazard ratio of one, that means there's no association. Greater than one, there's an increased risk, and less than one is a smaller risk. So let's go to the first study, and this is the Empareg study. And in the Empareg study, this was published in New England Journal of Medicine in 2015, Look at who's tested. Patients who are type 2 diabetic, they have prior history of cardiovascular disease, they're elderly, uncontrolled diabetes with nephropathy. Mind you, they're nephropathic, they have microalbuminuria, but their kidney function are well within uh, stable levels. And you could see these patients were on ACE or ARBs. And they randomized them to empagliposin, 25 milligram and 10 milligram dose, versus placebo. And for almost three years, and the primary outcome, as you can see here, is the composite of cardiovascular death, non-fatal MI, and non-fatal stroke. And you could see the difference between placebo as well as those who were on Empereg. And look at the hazard ratios, all significant, 0 0.86, 0 0.62, 0 0.68. And you can see that in this slide, um, you could see the separation between placebo as well as empagliposin, um, primary outcome, as well as death from any cause, cardiovascular cause, and hospitalization for heart failure. So this will be a familiar uh, picture whenever you see these studies. And you can see the separation between placebo versus empagliposin. Now there's also a signal for decreasing hemoglobin A1C. So those patients who were on 25 milligrams at 12 weeks and at 94 weeks, as compared to those over in 10 milligrams. And there's also a signal for improvement in blood pressure. Again, let me mention, these patients had their kidney function were not necessarily the stage three, stage four patients that we normally see. So this is the A1C. Uh, and again, you can see the separation between placebo versus patients who were on uh, 10 milligrams versus and 25 milligrams. Probably not much difference between the doses, but as compared to placebo, there's a significant difference there. So in conclusion, the author said, patients who have type two diabetes and are at high risk for cardiovascular events, who were given empagliposin, had lower rate of primary composite cardiovascular outcome and of death from any cause when the study drug was added to standard care, which is RAS inhibition. Let's look at the second study, and this is really a study, this publication um, consists of two trials, the CANVAS and the CANVAS-R trials. So total of almost 10,000 patients, well, 10,000 plus patients, again, elderly, uncontrolled diabetes. Majority of them had cardiovascular disease. Again, the average GFR is 76. So again, these patients really had good kidney function randomized to canagliflozin and placebo for four years. And as you can see here, there's again a significant difference between those who were randomized to canagliflozin versus placebo. There's a decrease of 4.6 events per 1,000 patient years. Um, as I said before, just like in empagliflozin, there's an improvement in your A1C and blood pressure, but there's also an improvement in weight. A lot of these patients lost weight. There is, however, a signal for amputations. And uh, I'll show you that. So again, the almost similar um, Kaplan-Meier curves where you see the separation between the placebo and the canagliposin. Um, and again, A1C, you can see an improvement there. You see the blood pressure. Uh, also an improvement there, and the decline in body weight that's also there. And it has to be mentioned that these patients somehow had higher risk for amputation and infection of the male genitalia. And this is expected because if you have a high glucose content of your urine, certainly that's a nidus for infection. So this is kind of goes hand in hand with the mechanism that we know of SGLT2 inhibitors. So in conclusion, 
uh, in two, these two trials, Canvas and Canvas are patients with type 2 diabetes, elevated risk of cardiovascular disease. Those treated with canagliflozin had a lower risk of cardiovascular events as compared to those with placebo, but there was greater risk of amputation, primarily at the level of the toe or metatarsal. So this is sort of um, sort of riled up some uh, trepidation on use of these medications in these patients. So if you look at Empereg and the Canvas studies, and this is a forest plot that you can see, everything on the that goes to the left side of your screen is good, meaning to say it favors SGLT2 inhibitors, and everything on the right favors placebo. So you could see there's a lot of excitement in the medical community about this medication. So one thing that I, as you have heard me say, is that there's these patients in Empereg and Canvas, most of them have normal kidney function. So now we are going to look at the next study, which is the Credence study. This is the first dedicated renal endpoint, double blind, randomized trial uh, that was conducted. And this was published in 2019 uh, in New England Journal of Medicine. So in this patient, type 2 diabetic, they have UACR greater than 300, again, elderly patients. So the GFR in these patients is between, as you can see, mean GFR is around 57. So these are patients who really fit the category of chronic kidney disease. And these patients were on a stable maximum dose of tolerated ACE or ARBs for four weeks. So they're already on board. And what the question here is, how would it translate into cardiovascular outcomes and renal outcomes? Your primary outcome includes cardiorenal uh, stuff, doubling of serum creatinine, and say kidney disease or death due to heart or kidney disease, and occurrence of end stage kidney, kidney disease, meaning to say uh, they went on dialysis. Now, one of the things that was shown in this study is that we, of course, we we're looking at the risk of amputations. And it wasn't there, okay? You see hazard ratio 1.1. Remember, I said hazard ratio one or greater is no association. So again, same familiar um, Kaplan-Meier curves. You see the primary outcomes. Now this study is really looking more at renal uh, in particular, and they really targeted the right patients. So what I'm showing here is the composite endpoint of the end-stage kidney disease uh, or renal death was lowered by 34% in the renal-specific composite outcome, and the relative risk of end-stage kidney disease was lowered by 32%. This slide, I want to show you this because this is important, and I want this to be burned in your brains. <laughs> if you examine the slope of the GFR over time, it shows that the SGLT2 inhibitor conforms to the pattern anticipated from the Brenner hypothesis that I mentioned earlier and verified in the RAS inhibitor era. There's an initial decline over the first couple of months of therapy, right? But it's followed by a dramatic reduced reduction in the loss of GFR over time. So this really goes hand in hand with what Brenner said in, from the beginning. So the canagliflozin group, again, had lower risk of cardiovascular death, myocardial infarction, or stroke and congestive heart failure. Looking at the risk of amputation and fracture, as we said, the hazard ratio is 1.11. So in conclusion, in patients with type 2 diabetes and kidney disease, the risk of kidney failure and cardiovascular events was lower in the canagliflozin group. And this is a median follow-up of almost three years. Now, there's another study um, which was subsequently published. This is uh, the Virtus CV uh, study. And this is more of a cardiac trial. But I, I want to mention to you that this is a non-inferiority trial. Okay? Uh, when we say non-inferiority, it, it, it's not a way to... Uh, um, look at something that is uh, equivalent, um, how would I put it? it? It's not a way for the company or the pharmaceutical industry 
to find an excuse why a drug is supposed to be out there. The non-inferiority means to say you're trying to compare the drug to a standard of care, and it's not lower than standard of care, so it's non-inferior. So this study, um, this one is a multi-center study, double-blinded, placebo-controlled. Your margin is 1.3, so that's kind of the number that you're going at. Type 2 diabetic patients, patients with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, followed for almost three and a half years. And again, you see the separation between ertugliflozin and placebo. So among patients with type 2 diabetes and atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, ertugliflozin was not inferior to placebo with respect to major adverse cardiovascular events. So you can see here, um, when you compare it to placebo, it's really non-inferior. Now, the next question that anybody, everybody would ask, well, is EMPA different from CANA and different from ERTU and SOTA, so on and so forth? So we did a study and we, looked, we analyzed the publications. And what we did was we looked at the heart failure, hospitalizations, and cardiovascular deaths, as well as major adverse cardiovascular events. So here, this, this figure here, just shows you the, the, the yellow are the patients with chronic kidney disease. So you can see that's why credence is really good as far as hammering what I'm trying to say here because these are the patients with chronic kidney disease, GFR less than 60. As compared to the other studies, they're more, you know, they're like, uh, or, you know, they happenstance to be there in the study. So they're not really targeted. But if you compare, look at these heart failure hospitalization as compared to placebo. In all the study, as you compare it to placebo, they all did the same thing. They were much lower than placebo. So we believe this is a class effect. So all SGLT2 inhibitors are actually going to do this. This is uh, composite renal outcome rates. Again, you could see as they are compared to placebo, you could see that difference. Now, this is a slide that sort of summarizes what I have been saying earlier. Um, Dr. Krikorian is probably going to talk more about the hemoglobin A1C lowering effects of these medications. Now remember, when these medications first came out, the goal was to make them, uh, this, uh, these were marketed as uh, anti-diabetic agents uh, because they decreased the A1C. So the cardiovascular and renal outcomes at the start were sort of, ah, yeah, they were there, but uh, is it really there? You know, so, so that's why it's there. Now, if you look, uh, Dr. Power is going to talk about the cardiovascular effects, you know, maze events and heart failure. So, but look at the kidney effects as with the SGLT2 inhibitors. They decrease albuminuria as well as GFR loss, both which are good things from the renal standpoint. Of course, we have to look at um, side effects, genital mycotic infections, DKA, and we mentioned here possibly amputations with canagliflozin. Um, I'm not going to go to the GLP and BPP4. Um, that's another topic. So if you look at the pharmacokinetic mechanisms of these different medications, and again, I, I, this, here I put the brand names. Uh, you know, EMPA is Jardians, DAPA is Parsiga, CANA is Invocana, and uh, ERTU is uh, Stiglatro. So you can see here, as they, you know, as they compare as far as their um, pharmacokinetics, um, so on and so forth. So what have these studies told us? Well, since 2013, this have shaped the way the guidelines uh, whether it's from an endocrine guideline, whether it's a nephrology guideline, or a cardiology guideline. And look at this. These are different countries who are starting to modify their, um, their guidelines based on these medications. You cannot ignore it. I have a friend who said that, you know, I think with everything that we know about SGLT2 inhibitors, it would be malpractice not to give them to patients, which, which you know, it means something. So you can see even here in the U.S., in the US these are the diabetes guidelines here in diabetes care. Again, they are being shaped. Okay. 
So the diabetes guidelines, uh, this is the 2020, and I, I call your attention, it did not show up here. I call your attention to the use of SGLT2 inhibitors in this algorithm. Um, I'm sure Dr. Corian will talk more about that. In 2015, which was two years after the approval of the first SGLT2 inhibitor in the US, I was invited to be part of this uh, work group, the KDGO Controversies Conference on the Management of Patients with Type 2 di with, uh, Diabetes and Chronic Kidney Disease. And in that meeting, the, the papers or the studies on SGLT2 inhibitors were just being finished. They were just in the process of being published. And at that point, we wrote a paper which is published in uh, Kidney International, and we talked about lifestyle measures, glycemic control, so on and so forth. The SGLT2 inhibitors uh, had a segment, and we had only more questions. What, how does this translate into cardiovascular outcomes, renal outcomes, so on and so forth. So in 2015, we were just drawing the framework for what's going, what's going to happen in the next few years. Fast forward to four years later, 2019, and this was, sorry, 2020 rather, uh, 2020, uh, this was uh, published in Kidney International. Um, and I invite you, you know, this, this is a free resource. This is actually free. If you just Google KDGO uh, Diabetes Guidelines, you can pull this out. There's a summary paper, and there's also a actual, like, I think 200, 300 page paper if you're really interested in it. <laughs> but anyway, what is in the guidelines? So this is the guidelines that nephrologists actually look at. So we talked about type 1, type 2 diabetes. We talked about this different stages of CKD and diabetes and the interventions, lifestyle, medications, systems, so on and so forth. We did not include blood pressure and lipids because there's a separate guideline for that. Um, prevention and screening, we did not do that as well. And topics with insufficient data, like diagnosis, pipeline therapy, so on and so forth. So what came out of this guideline? So this guideline, if you pull this out, and I'm just going to show you a couple of examples here. Um, of course, it starts with your lifestyle modifications, diet, so on and so forth. Uh, there's a nice um, list of practice pointers when you initiate ACE inhibitors or ARBs in patients with diabetic kidney disease. Who are the candidates? How often do you check your creatinine? When do you check it for the first time? When do you adjust it? When do you discontinue it? And then there's also a um, segment on metformin. You know, as you know, uh, many, uh, a few years ago, there's been a, for chronic kidney disease, there's some trepidation in using metformin. But this is now, with, the, with all of the studies that have been published that, that we know, we know metformin is safe for patients with chronic kidney disease. But in patients with lower or more advanced kidney disease, that's, those are the patients in whom we start avoiding metformin. So let's look at the practice pointers in the guideline that actually point to um, SGLT2 inhibitors. So here, glycemic management for patients with type 2 diabetes and chronic kidney disease should include metformin and an SGLT2 inhibitor and additional drug therapy as needed for glycemic control. And also, number two, these patients, if they have GFR greater than 30, they would benefit from treatment with both metformin and SGLT2 inhibitors. So this is uh, a strong uh, level guideline. It's like 1B. And because this is based on what, we, what I just showed you, the publications, the Empereg, the, the Canvas, as well as Credence, I'm not going to belabor this slide, but again, as I, I invite you to, to pull out the article from, um, from, from Google, from KD, the KDGO guidelines, but you can see here, um, reasonable to withhold SGLT2 inhibitor in times of prolonged fasting or critical medical illness. So when a patient gets admitted to the hospital and they are being treated for AKI, for an infection, you want to hold it off. 
Uh, in patients who are at risk for hypovolemia, consider decreasing your thiazide or loop diuretic dosages before starting SGLT2 inhibitors. And also uh, advise patients to look out for signs and symptoms of intravascular volume depletion. A reversible decrease in GFR with initiation of SGLT2 inhibitors may occur and is generally not an indication to discontinue therapy. Remember when I showed you that earlier slide when the GFR goes down and then it sort of stabilizes up? That's the reason because some people might think, oh, I tried the SGLT2 and the GFR went down, I have to stop it. You don't. Once you start it, you can continue even if the GFR falls below 30 unless reversible changes in GFR are precipitating uremic symptoms or other complications. So again, you have to monitor these patients. And the studies that I've shown you are done in patients with, um, without kidney transplant, with GFRs greater than 30, in patients with type 2 diabetes, not type 1. So those patients, you cannot use them. It is not recommended at this time to use these medications. So if you look at this algorithm, and you're trying to control diabetes, control the blood sugar. If um, can lower glycemic target be safely achieved by adding an SGLT2 inhibitor? Yes. If no, you can discontinue or decrease the dose uh, of the other medication. Or if yes, you could add an SGLT2 inhibitor. You have to educate patients about the potential adverse effects, follow up the blood sugar, and monitor for adverse effects. Now, this is sort of the overarching guideline on pharmacotherapy in these patients. So obviously, at the top of the line, you have your physical activity, nutrition, and weight loss. And your first line of treatment is metformin and SGLT2 inhibitor. Okay? So you can see here, SGLT2 inhibitor, GFR is greater than 30. If they are less than 30, don't initiate them. Right? So patients with stage 4 are not candidates yet. Patients on dialysis do not put them on SGLT2 inhibitors. Now, this, are, this is a list of the studies that have been published in di for diabetic kidney disease. These are the outcome trials. And you can look, look at the outcomes. And I'm just going to, to you know, again, my, my talk is supposed to be really only on renal outcomes. And we are going to talk a little bit more about the other studies that have been published here. But right now, there are still ongoing EMPA kidney and flow studies. Um, this is actually semaglutide, by the way. EMPA kidney is actually looking at patients with more advanced chronic kidney disease. Those patients who are stage 4 and stage 5 patients. Is there a benefit there? Uh, what do the outcomes look like? So if you um, look here, these are the renal outcome studies, uh, DAPA, CKD, and EMPA kidney. Again, these are a uh, lot of patients enrolled in these studies. Um, and you can see here, patients are on ACE or ARBs uh, because that's the, the standard therapy. These patients have to be on ACE or ARB. And here, uh, you can see the GFR and the UACR. So these are the typical patients who are chronic kidney disease patients. So the Tedigo guidelines were published in um, November 2020. And since that time, a few more studies have been published. So which the next few studies I'm going to talk about were not included in the guidelines. Okay? So the guidelines were published before these papers were published, uh, meaning to say this, this Next studies are only either going to bolster the thought that was being uh, promulgated in the guidelines or they're going to oppose it. And I'll tell you the, the studies supported everything that was already been published. So this one is the Emperor Reduced Study. This is an uh, international study, 20 countries, again, double blind. These patients have class 2 to 4 heart failure with an EF of less than 40%. Uh, followed for over a year, and you could see here 
Again, those patients on EMPA, uh, look at the hazard ratios you can see here. And also the annual rate of decline of GFR. Similar um, Kaplan-Meier curves. And this is the adjusted mean change from GFR. Again, you can see the decline, right, in the first four months, but it then stabilizes. And the decline in GFR is, is there. So they concluded among patients receiving recommended therapy for heart failure, those on the EMPA group had a lower risk of cardiovascular death or hospitalization for heart failure than those in the placebo plus minus diabetes. The other study, which is uh, which I only could wish that this was published before the guidelines because this really strengthens what we know renal-wise. This is the DAPA CKD study. Um, so DAPA CKD, again, multi-center randomized trial, double blind, 4,000 patients, GFR 25 to 75, patients had microalbuminuria, followed for 2.4 years. This study was actually stopped early because of efficacy. They could not continue it any further because there's nothing else to prove that what they've already proven in the duration that they, they, they did here. So again, familiar Kaplan-Meier curves. I want to show you here, again, I emphasize this. Examination of the slope of the GFR shows that SGLT2 inhibitor conforms to that pattern that Brenner was saying. And as you have that decline, it stabilizes. So among patients with chronic kidney disease, plus minus diabetes, the risk of a composite of sustained decline in the estimated GFR of at least 50% and say kidney disease or death was lower in the dapagliflozid group. Um, this is the other study, sotagliflozin. This is the uh, scored study. This is what Chad was mentioning. This, the, the weird thing about this is, is that it's not only an SGLT2 inhibitor, but also an SGLT1 inhibition, inhibitor. Um, a little bit disappointing because this, act, this study actually um, was stopped early because they lost funding in these patients. Um, okay. So, in conclusion, patients with diabetes and chronic kidney disease plus minus albuminuria, also sotagliflozin resulted in a lower risk of composite of deaths from cardiovascular causes, hospitalizations for heart failure, and urgent visits for heart failure. This is the last study which I want to show you here is not an SGLT2 inhibitor. This is a this is phenerenone. This is a non-steroidal mineralocorticoid antagonist. This is not your typical epelrenone or spironolactone. And again, uh, this is um, there's a lot of questions on this in this study uh, because although this study really showed, and you can see here the hazard ratios about uh, as far as primary composite outcome, which is kidney failure, decrease in GFR, uh, death from renal causes, and cardiovascular deaths. Again, impressive, hazard ratio is less than one. The problem here is there's a signal for hyperkalemia. So we don't know. We don't know yet much about this. This is the Fidelio study. There's another study which is called which is ongoing right now called the Figaro study. So again, it's like the operas, right? Fidelio, Figaro. Uh, so the, the studies are really saying that this medication has an added benefit for renal and cardiovascular outcomes. So is phenerenone an add-on to SGLT2, or is it a replacement in patients who cannot tolerate SGLT2? We don't know yet, okay? So more studies have yet to come out. But again, you could see the same Kaplan-Meier curves. And um, again, phenerenone and anything to the left of the line is, is better. Uh, and as I said earlier, there's a risk for hyperkalemia. So in patients with CKD and type 2 diabetes, treat treatment with phenerenone resulted in lower risk of CKD progression 
and cardiovascular events than placebo. So what have we witnessed in the past five years? We, you know, the last time we had positive studies on diabetic kidney disease was Captopril. The collaborative study group from Rush did the studies. Uh, they were, we're all so excited. Captopril is here. It slowed uh, renal progression. It decreased proteinuria, decreased albuminuria. And then suddenly now we have this. Uh, we have the uh, rise of the plosins. Um, so, if you look at the uh, kidney outcomes and cardiovascular outcomes, and I guess I'm just going to focus here, you could see these are the studies that I, I kind of discussed. And look at the hazard ratios, all like 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7. They're all improvement of cardiovascular or, or improvement of renal outcomes. Um, I'm not, you know, this might be a little bit difficult to see, but this is the Canadian Society of Nephrology guidelines uh, on the use of uh, SGLT2 inhibitors. Uh, again, the slides, by the way, are, are if you want to have a copy, let me know, and I, and I can email them to you, or Chad has a copy of the PDF of the slides. This is another paper that was recently published in the Clinical Journal of the American Society of Nephrology. Um, sort of gives you an algorithm as to which patients or how to start these patients on, on SGLT2 inhibitors, you know, or GLP-1 receptor agonists, which one do you choose? Right now, for patients with G GFR greater than 60, and we, we recommend SGLT2 inhibitor. It's preferred, okay? With albuminuria or microalbuminuria, SGLT2 inhibitor is preferred. For patients with stage four and lower, we we recommend GLP-1 receptor agonists. Initiation of SGLT2 is currently contraindicated in these patients. Now, we are not going to ignore the side effects or the adverse effects of these medications. So what can you do? You know the benefit is there. You know, if, if, I'm, if you have a patient in whom you are going to decrease the rate of having a stroke and a heart attack and uh, being on dialysis for a few years versus the risk of having a mycotic genital infection, you know, you have to really appreciate the importance of this. So what can you do to avoid avert this, infect, the, the, this adverse effect? So for genital fungal infection, have the patients keep the genital area dry and clean, maybe prophylactic topical treatment for fungal infection. For patients who are prone to Volume depletion, you know, make sure you adjust the dose of the diuretics when you put them on SGLT2 inhibitors. Have a sick day protocol. Sick day protocol means to say you tell the patients if you get have, if you have nausea, vomiting, diarrhea from for whatever reason, you have to hold off your ACE or ARBs or your SGLT2 inhibitors for that day or for a few days before you resume it. Right? Uh, patients with um, urinary tract infection. DKA. This is important. Again, I'm not going to go into much detail, but we have seen reports of SGLT2 inhibitor leading to euglycemic diabetic ketoacidosis. And so I go back to the guidelines. The guidelines have been written, right? But the guidelines are not written in stones or tablets, right? Uh, we use the guideline to guide us in the way we practice medicine. So you think about it, if you have a patient in your clinic, that patient may or may not even qualify in that study. So you always have to think that. You always have to individualize therapy. With that, I say thank you very much. And if you have any questions, please feel free. Thank you. There's no person who will tell you that this is the rule. Uh, again, these are guidelines, okay? 
Uh, so every person, so if, if it was me, and Rydell might do it differently, Thomas might do it differently. If it was me, I usually see these patients in my clinic and they already have a smattering of creatinine from many months or years. That's my baseline. I put them on an SGLT2 and I'll say, okay, I'll see you in four to six weeks. We'll have a repeat lab. At that point, I could see where I'm going. If, again, the decline is there, but if you see a patient with a creatinine of, uh, say, 1.0 baseline and then six, well, that's not necessarily, uh, oh my God, uh, that's still okay. No, it's not, right? So again, individualized therapy. Uh, every person will have a different approach to it, but it is prudent to recheck it around four to six weeks, kind of. Thank you very much for the presentation. Along the lines of Smith's question, what would you, if you check that, um, you know, that BNP in four to six weeks, what's an acceptable <laughs> decline in GFR for you, assuming that nothing else is going on? Yeah, I, I knew you were going to ask that question uh, when I answered that. Um, so what we know from the ACE, in the ACE and ARB studies is we're looking at 30%, right? The study is really 22%. This is for ACE or ARBs. 22, they just rounded it up. Okay, let's do 30%. It's easier to remember. I, I think that's a prudent number to use. Uh, it's not, I'm not telling you it's guideline-based. If you, if you get into court and you get sued, don't call me. <laughs> okay. But I, I think it's a general, uh, you know, having a 30% uh, quote-unquote uh, margin, I, I think that's, that would be my personal uh, number. There might be some papers when the EMPA kidney gets published, it might give us more guideline or more direct evidence that, okay, it's actually between 22 to 35, you know, something like that. Does that make sense? Thank you very much, Dr. Hill. Oh, hey. Perfect. That was great. Uh, thanks. Yeah.